Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage Podcast. I'm Doug Berkey, Executive Director of Mitchell Institute. Here on Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DOD, industry, and other subject matter experts to explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. If you like learning about aerospace power, you're in the right place. So to our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thanks so much for joining us. And as a reminder, if you like what you hear, please do us a favor and follow our show. And give us a like and leave a comment so we can keep charting the trajectories that matter most to you. It's one of the most distinctive elements of modern military air power. The roar of a jet engine with an aircraft racing down the runway and launching into the sky. In today's jet engine technologies, they take combat aircraft to beyond the speed of sound and generate power needed to run an amazing suite of avionics. And a lot of us take engine technology for granted. We just see an amazing airplane sitting on the ramp, and the jet's buried deep inside. And frankly, engine technology, it's so reliable, it almost never fails. And that's a huge mistake to become complacent. An engine is the heart of any modern warplane. Take it away, and you've got an expensive brick sitting on the runway. And a modern jet engine is so sophisticated that there are only a handful of companies in the world who can design and produce this technology. The barriers to entry are incredibly high, with several nations making the attempt, but few succeed. So if you're in the club, you certainly don't want to lose that position. But it's also a market experiencing significant change. For years, we've been able to meet mission requirements with a set of engines developed in the 1970s and 80s. And sure, they're modernized and improved, but the underlying designs are mature. Now, new mission requirements are shaking things up, and America's jet engine companies are going to have to look at a generational wave of improvements needed to meet emerging requirements. And on top of this, their competitive edge faces pressure from China, who's invested a lot to compete in this realm. And that means America's unilateral propulsion advantage can't be taken for granted. So today, we're going to talk to an expert who helps build jet engines and is innovating the next generation technologies. But first, to kick this off, I'd like to bring in Major General Larry Stutzream to help establish some one-on-one context about what it's like to fly and fight from an operator's perspective and the jet engine's role in that. So Stutz, thanks for being here. Hey, love being with you, Doug. You've flown with a lot of different engines, everything from the J-79 and the F-4 to the F-100 and F-110 and the right. F-16, the T F-34 and the A-10. So what do we need to know about this technology from a building block level? Okay, so you want some Jet Engine 101, the basics, right? Yeah, help us break it down. Okay. First, let me say, Doug, the technology and engineering is truly fantastic in Jet Engine, but the concept's actually very simple. To preview, essentially, air comes in the front of the engine. It's compressed, fuel's injected and ignited, and the air expands, and it blasts out the back of the engine, giving thrust for the engine to move forward hopefully attached to an airplane. It's really as simple as that, but let me go one level deeper, get the design pieces for the rest of our discussion here. You have a cold section of the engine, which is where the air comes in, and then just before you start to add gas and spark to burn, that's the cold section. Everything past that to the engine nozzle is the warm section. So if you look at the airport at a commercial airliner, you're looking at a fan, the fan section, as you look inside the intake. And that fan section is different types of engines, but essentially the fan sucks in the air into the engine and it divides it. Some of it goes down the core of the engine where it's mixed with fuel and burn, and some goes on the outside of the engine depending on that engine design, it can reduce noise, it can cool the engine, and it can also provide thrust for the engine. Right after that is a compressor section. And what we want to do in a jet engine is really squish that air down so it's full of incredible potential energy. For example, when I was flying the F-4 and the J-79, it compressed the air about 12 times what it is normally. And that went through 17 stages of the compressor. Past that compressor is now the combustor, and that's where the fuel is added. And that really packed air explodes. It's a continuous ignition. Past that combustor is a what you might call is a power transfer turbine. And so that hot air hits that turbine, spins it, and that turbine then drives the core of the engine to keep everything rotating. Uh, and then past that, you have what's either called the exhaust section or sometimes it's called the mixer and the nozzle. 
And in that, you now have that air traveling out the back end, and that's your thrust. Now, in fighter aircraft, Doug, as you have the afterburner in this section, and that's where you just put raw gas into that hot gas. When I mean raw gas, raw jet fuel goes right into that hot gas, and you get an incredible surge in thrust. But you need that in combat, but it also uses a lot of gas. And so you don't want to use that a whole lot, but it's pretty cool. Now, now, an important aspect that we don't think about a lot, but it's so important to this discussion is the engine also does a couple other things. It provides power to two very important things in the aircraft, especially fighter aircraft today. You have lots of avionics and capabilities. They might be uh, weapons control. They might be navigation. They might be electronic warfare. It might be the radar. These take a lot of electrical energy, and so you have to be driving off that engine to create that electricity. And then all those avionics and modern fighters create lots of heat. And if they're not cooled, they'll be damaged or they'll stop functioning. And so the engine also provides cooling capacity to keep all those avionics cool. There's a lot of ways to do that, like taking bleed air or some air off the compressor that's cool and distributing around to cool the components. And so I think, Doug, that's the basic parts and pieces and how the engine works. Now, I really appreciate that. It's complex stuff, but it is just so important. Now, we've talked about this a lot over the years, but your career follows the trajectory of some of the most prolific, successful military aircraft engines ever made. Specifically, I'm thinking about the F-100 and F-110 that power the F-16s you flew, and they're also in F-15s. Were these engines instant success stories when you first started flying them, or was there a ramp to maturity? Oh, they were huge success stories, but they took time to mature. The F-100 and F-110 were designs, new designs from scratch. And what drives new engine design, it all begins with the need to keep up with the threat. And then advancing technology allows for huge increases in aircraft and engine performance. For example, going from the F-4, it had two J-79 engines. They were turbojets engines. They had about the same thrust as two mature or one mature F-100 or F-110 engine that I flew in the F-16. So obviously a huge increase in performance capability. This doesn't just happen overnight. There's requirements for new materials, new metals, new electronics and so forth to get that required performance based upon where we're being driven as far as threat in the world today. Yeah, there were early Early on, there were teething issues. The F-16 got its name, nickname. They called it the Lawn Dart because we lost squadrons of the aircraft in the first of its years. And it, some of the, those losses were related to engines, not all of them, of course. And I did about five accident investigations in, in my career, and the ones I did happened to be all engine-related. For example, the F-16 had some issues with handling the extreme temps in the exhaust can section. There were some other design weaknesses in there. And in certain cases, the burner can could actually fall off the engine, off the aircraft, which substantially reduced its thrust, almost to a non-flyable thrust situation. I talked about the power and the cooling and so forth. There was a case where a design of how The energy was taken off the engine into gearboxes. There was a shaft, a tower shaft that failed, which resulted in the complete shutdown of the engine. So, yeah, there were teething issues, but now these engines are incredibly reliable. And don't forget, they're incredibly maintainable and sustainable. And that's really thanks to an incredibly talented industrial base. And back during that time period, there's a lot of competition. And as a fighter pilot, we love that with the engine companies competing with each other because they squeezed out the best they could possibly get out of those fighter aircraft and those engines. So today we see, as we come forward to today, we've got a huge need for increased performance, fuel efficiency to have more combat time and loiter and so forth. And the engine producers today still have a challenge regarding the size, weight, the power, the cooling, and the cost of what we do with our aircraft engines and they need to have an eye for growth because we're always adding capabilities to our new aircraft designs. It's interesting the history you're describing 
that's 40 years ago in some instances. And you are talking a little bit about where we are today, but that surge in innovation, all the lines of new tech that are being innovated, how do you see that compared to where we are right now? Yeah. Back in what, late 70s, we were developing a dozen gen engine types. We had, you know, like I said, the F4s J79, the B52s J57, a lot of engines. And so there was an incredibly robust industrial base, lots of competition, lots of innovation, which drove, by the way, the needed second tier technologies to get to the modern engines of today. So today, it's much reduced. We have less engine producers. We have existing designs that have been around for quite a while. Even a new aircraft like the F-22 is flying with a jet engine that was designed, what, back in the 1980s. Let's look at one today, the F-35, an incredible aircraft. Its F-135 engine is incredibly advanced over the designs of the 100 and 110 I talked about earlier. It's an amazing piece of technology, but its origins, the design came before the turn of the millennium here back in 2000. And the advance of that aircraft, the way it was designed to continue to be improved, to add capabilities to the aircraft, well, the jet's power and cooling demands have grown markedly, and those increased demands need to be addressed at some point in the future. So let's pull the thread out a little bit more. We're kind of at a key inflection point. You've got F-35 coming online with TR-3 Block 4, so a whole new wave of capabilities that are transforming that jet. You've got next-generation air dominance fighter. You've got a lot of other types that are on the horizon. Where, what do you see the future holding for future military jet engines? Only growth because, once again, the threat is driving the need for improved aircraft capabilities of aircraft we have in production today and next generations of aircraft. They're going to need power plants, new engines that give you, have the swap C as it is, the size, weight, the power, the cooling, and at the cost that's necessary to keep the aircraft overall from being affordable. But you're going to see a huge increase in demand for that power and cooling and let me say, for continued performance improvements, but especially with respect to how efficient you are with the gas that you can put in the airplane. When you can have a more efficient engine, you're going to have more time in the combat arena. You can go farther. And today, with where we see the conflict potentials headed, which is in the Indo-Pacific, vast ranges to deal with the threats coming out of China. And so that ability to really get a, a few more miles out of each pound of gas is very important. So whether the F-35 specifically is going to get a new engine, whether it's GE or Pratt, bottom line, the current aircraft lacks sufficient power and cooling capacity, and that's got to be dealt with, or we can't see continued improvements in the airplane. But by the way, I will note that's why the next generation airplane, NGAD, uh, which is out there in the 2030s sometimes when we'll see it, it's going to have a completely new design engine in it, I would project. That's uh, really well said. So we're not the only ones in the game, though. You've also got China and Russia. How do you view their progress in this zone? Of course, they capture a lot of our technology through nefarious means, but they are going to continue to improve. They we, right now, we have a lead in avionics. We have a lead in our innovation. I think our industrial innovation is ahead of anything they can do. And so it's all going to be about our competitive advantage in the ability to innovate, deliver quality, get, have that range of performance that the threat demands us to have. And those attributes that I'm talking about, being able to compete with China, is going to probably be best handled when you have really healthy industrial basing and industrial competition. And Doug, that's why it's so important that the Department of Defense truly regards how they apply their resources in terms of not just proceeding with advanced engine capabilities and design and production, 
but also all of the technologies that need to be matured to feed the next generation of engines. That might be materials, might be avionics, it might be other things like that. Now, I really appreciate that. So we're going to dive deeper into this. And for that, there's really nobody better than somebody who actually innovates and builds and sustains this technology. And for that, I want to bring David Tweedy of General Electric into this conversation. He's a vice president and general manager for advanced products at GE's Edison Works. And as you know, GE has been a major player in aircraft propulsion for decades. So, sir, thanks for being here. Great to be here. Love to showcase some of the great work that the GE team is doing in the advanced combat space. That's no, fantastic. Stutz just painted a picture of where he sees the future demand signal tracking when it comes to tomorrow's military jet engines. And what are your thoughts on that? I mean, on one hand, the U.S. has the most capable fighter engines in the world today, but at some point, they're not going to be sufficient to meet the future demands. And what are the main attributes you think are going to be crucial for future designs? You know, I think we see the world very similar to the way Stutz lined things up. In some areas, I would say, are the typical user needs. Thrust, more thrust. Since time immemorial, pilots have always wanted more thrust, whether that's to bring more kinetic capability to the fight, to the point of weapons release, or to overcome increases in payload or drag that ultimately come with aircraft throughout their evolution. That's desire for continued thrust. We certainly hear loud and clear, as, as well as durability, which really strikes at the readiness as well as affordability for our customers. So continued improvements in those areas. What you did also highlight on is what I would call a re-emerging area of importance, and that's range and persistence. You talked about the tyranny of distance in the Indo-Pacific. I would add the ever-increasing size of the contested environment really means that the survivable assets need to have a significantly extended range in order to get to the fight. And then when they're there, a significant amount of extended persistence in that contested area which really speaks to a transformational level of fuel efficiency. We hear that loud and clear from the warfighter. And then, again, as discussed, probably a newer element for engines is around power and thermal. A lot of these advanced applications, the F-35 and beyond, are described as sensor shooters, with the sensor part of that equation being just as important as the shooter part of the equation. And that's enabled by all of the mission systems that get put on the platform. And as discussed, the engine needs to provide the power for those systems. Those systems generate a tremendous amount of heat. And now jet engines are asked to be not just power and thrust producing devices, but now we're asked to be thermal management devices as well. So thrust, durability, range persistence, power and thermal, kind of four big elements. We view three stream adaptive engines as the best way to bring all four capabilities to bear in a meaningful way in terms of being able to move the dial compared to current state of the art. And and there's three big elements in those. The adaptive engine, the ability to flex operational modes between a higher fuel efficiency mode, more similar to a commercial engine to give you that extended range and persistence a third stream architecture moving off of the two stream turbofan architecture, really enabling significant growth in thermal management. And then that next step in component technology, advanced manu- in manufacturing and materials technologies to ring out more and more capability. So bringing those three things together in one package, we think is the best way to, to hit on all four of the emerging customer needs. Now that's a really good summary. So, Putting your engineer hat on here, help our audience understand where does the approach of upgrading existing engines really start to to hit a point of diminishing returns, and we've got to move to something next. The Air Force obviously decided to move on from the F-4s, J-79s back in the day that Stutz talked about for a fundamentally new engine for the F-15 and F-16. So how do we look at what are the limiting parts of an engine that demand a clean sheet approach at some point? I think it comes down to when has the architecture really tapped out and maximized its capability to provide significant improvements with continued investments. And scientists and technologists will look at things like technology S-curves. And if you can envision over time, if you plot capability of a given technology, you can spend years in a very flat part of that curve as the scientists and engineers are really trying to figure out how to harness new physics and bring those two together into a meaningful benefit in terms of a product. 
then you hit an inflection point when you get the science together into a product and you go through a rapid pace of innovation and improvement in those products. And then you end up plateauing out where continued investment really doesn't provide significant improvements in capability. And what was discussed is I think the turbo jets are a great example of that. The throughout the years leading into World War II and throughout, there was teams of German and British scientists and engineers working independently on how to harness gas turbine technology as a replacement for radial piston engines. It, it, and they spent years working on that to prove feasibility. And it was shortly at the end of that war throughout the late 1940s through the 1950s and early 1960s, when the jet engine industry transitioned both commercial and military to that single stream turbojet architecture. And you saw radical improvements in power, thrust to weight, altitude capability, speed capability, durability, reliability. But by the time you get to the mid to late 1960s, you've run out of, out of room for continued improvement. And when the DOD made the transition from what we now call third generation to fourth generation aircraft, they knew something different was needed. And that was the shift to the two stream mixed flow turbine arc, tur mixed flow turbofan architecture that we've used as an industry over these last 40 to 50 years. And you saw that rapid pace of improvements that Stutz talked about in terms of dur durability, reliability, performance, all driven through competitive opportunities. You know, for your audience, a simpler example that everybody's probably familiar with is cell phones. There was a point in time when all of us used flip phones and every year the companies would come out with a slightly smaller, slightly lighter weight flip phone. But then ultimately each incremental improvement was less and less beneficial to the customer base. And then one day somebody came out with a smartphone and it wasn't overnight. They spent years working on the foundational technologies to pull that together into an integrated product, but it fundamentally shifted the capabilities that the consumer has and what they viewed a phone as. That's a common example. We see in the commercial aerospace world examples where the classic tube and wing design powered by high bypass turbofans has been the architecture that all commercial products have been based on for about the last 40 or 50 years. And the amount of year to year incremental improvements and in efficiency have been amazing. Yet, as we look forward to what the next decade looks to be and, and what the needs are, more and more of the same is not what we need. We need on the propulsion side to look at things like open rotor architecture, hybrid electric, airframers exploring, trace brushed wing architectures, blended wing bodies. So everybody's come to the point where they realize we have to do something fundamentally different to get transformational improvements. And so pulling it back to the question on fighter engines, just like we made the shift from radial piston engines to turbojets, from turbojets to turbofans, we think we're at that inflection point. We've done the hard work to mature three stream adaptive technologies. We think we've got product relevant demonstration. Now we're ready to bring and move forward across multiple platforms with this fundamentally new approach to combat propulsion. So I really like that cell phone analogy, by the way, that was useful. I hadn't heard it before like that. And that was very helpful. If we're looking at understanding how you're injecting these improvements and all, are there paradigms in play to help us understand where you break it down to get the gains. Obviously, you got new design concepts. You can size the core differently. You've talked about third stream. There are obviously material that you can inject with new designs and all. How do you, what's the model in your mind of how you look at it? Yeah, I'll reflect back on the three key innovations and I'll explain how we were breaking the paradigm or the classic design trades that engineers have had to make for the last 20 or 30 years. So let's first talk with the adaptive engine. So whether it's a commercial turbofan or a military turbofan, for the last 40 or 50 years, they have been two stream devices, a core and a fan stream. And the engineer gets to pick, do you wanna optimize for fuel efficiency? And in that case, you move to a much higher bypass ratio. So the fan stream is much larger than the core stream. You have a much lower fan pressure ratio that's why you see bigger and bigger fans on commercial engines, and that's how you drive towards better and better fuel efficiency. Uh, fighter engines have stuck with more of a low bypass ratio of design, so much smaller fans, multi-stage fans at much higher fan pressure ratio, which are really sized and optimized for thrust. 
and you can pick which one you want to optimize for, but it, traditionally it's always been fixed. Adaptive engines break that paradigm. For the first time in a product configuration that we could introduce into the field, we've demonstrated the ability where you can flex between a more fuel efficient mode and a more traditional high thrust mode, all within a single engine, all frankly transparent to the pilot. It's handled automatically by the control system. So the adaptive engine breaks that paradigm of having to trade between thrust versus fuel efficiency. I think the second thing that breaks a paradigm is the third stream architecture. As you discussed, one of the ways to deal with thermal management in a conventional engine is to take bleed air from the compressor. That's great. That comes at the expense of durability, which I think has been well documented with the current F-35 fleet. And so there's a classic thermal versus durability trade. The third stream architecture is a different way of bringing thermal management capability to bear and breaks that classic trade. In the third element of that stool, the materials and manufacturing technologies, and for GE, it's really two technologies we focus on. Additive technology, 3D printing, and ceramic matrix composites. The first additive, 3D printing, really unshackles the design engineer from the constraints of traditional manufacturing techniques. And that can really break the complexity versus cost trade that, that we historically have, as well as help us on advanced thermal management packaging within a real world fighter engine and breaking the weight versus thermal capability trade. And finally, ceramic matrix composites, that hot section that Stutz referred to are traditionally filled with nickel-based super alloys, metallic designs. GE has advanced ceramic-based composite material systems. They offer one-third the weight of traditional nickel-based systems. They can run three to 500 degrees hotter and still have improved durability even at those elevated temperatures. Some of the simple physics of a jet engine, if you want more performance, you run it hotter. When you run it hotter, you lose durability. Uh, the ability to move the needle in the good direction on both durability and performance is another break of that paradigm. So the innovations that we've been working on here over these last 15 years are really meant to break all the classic trades that, that we've had to deal with as an industry in the previous decades. And it's not just each of those, it's the interplay and the synergy. They feed off each other where the whole in terms of the capability we're bringing at the system level is much greater than the sum of the individual parts. I appreciate that. So there are two main programs in play right now when it comes to new combat aircraft jet engines and not just iterative improvement. First, we've got adaptive engine transition program, which many called ATP, and then next generation adaptive propulsion or NGAP for short. So can you just walk us through the basics of these? We see them in the press a lot. People confuse them quite often, but what are the core requirements that we're trying to, to meet here and how are these playing out in the design process and what separate the two efforts? How are they different? Yep. So as you mentioned, AETP, the Adaptive Engine Transition Program, launched in 2016, and that was the representative transition within the Air Force community from an Air Force Research Laboratory effort towards a life cycle management center effort. And that really is part of that. We transitioned from a science and technology maturation mindset to that plus product relevant prototyping with focused on real world requirements, whether they be weight, packaging, reliability, maintainability, safety. The goals of the program were to build multiple flight weight, full scale prototype engines designed to product requirements. Uh, we happen to be sized and optimized to integrate specifically into the F-35A. So we've worked closely with Lockheed Martin throughout the course of the program to ensure that. It was a competitive program. Uh, GE's prototype engine in that is designated the XA-100. At this point in time, we have built and tested two full-scale prototypes. We have hundreds of hours of test experience under our belt, both at our facilities here in Evendale, Ohio as well as the government's full altitude test cell capability at Arnold Engineering Development Center. So we've exercised this engine across the full flight envelope. We've gotten great data from them, and we can substantiate the major performance gains that this technology has on offer. And in fact, throughout the spring and summer, we continue with our phase three testing of our XA100 prototype. It's a great program, and we're continuing with it. 
and it represents, because of its alignment with the F-35, the most direct transition and the fastest way to get the capability into the hands of a warfighter. In 2018, a parallel and related program, Next Generation Adaptive Program, was launched. Uh, the vision for that program was to leverage heavily from the foundational work completed in ACP and carry that forward into design sized and optimized for the Air Force's NGAT family of systems. Strong leverage from a component system architecture perspective. GE has an engine designation of the XA102, and we're moving forward in a competitive pro prototyping environment and very excited to carry that program across the goal line here in the coming years. So that's it started with AETP, product relevant prototyping, size and optimized for the F-35, now launching into a parallel effort, size and optimized for the family of systems. We see a ton of great synergy between these two programs you know, because the XA-100 was more than a science and technology effort. It truly was a product relevant prototype designed to product requirements the engines have run well. We've gotten great data and continue to get great data. The more we continue to continue down that path, highly relevant lessons that we can leverage over into NGAP and burn down risk early in that program as we try to meet the success criteria of delivering for the customer over there. Big picture, how long have you been working on the technologies related to these programs? I think it's important for our audience to understand you don't just flip a switch and produce a brand new jet engine. I assume it goes back many years. Yeah, in fact, it really goes back to 2007 is really when I would say we began the latest in incarnation in, in seriousness of purpose. And this represents from 2007 through 2023 here today that early phase of technology exploration foundational work, product prototyping that's part of that technology S curve. And now we're at that inflection point where we can launch off in, into fielding. In 2007, the Air Force Research Laboratory launched the ADVENT program. It was a science and technology focused effort, really just looking at three stream adaptive cycle engines with additive and advanced high temperature materials. Could you even get those to come together in a single package in a jet engine and actually work? That really was the foundational work. GE is proud to be the only industry competitor to compete for, be awarded and successfully complete the advent program, which we gave us a strong foundation and start in 2012 when we launched into the AETD program, Adaptive Engine Technology Development Program, another follow-on effort run by the Air Force Research Laboratory, also a competitive multi-participant effort. And that really was that first step towards product relevant prototyping with the focus on the preliminary design. We've been worked, working on this for 15 years for the first half of that with the Air Force Research Laboratory for these last seven years or so with the Lifecycle Management Center culminating in the product relevant prototyping that's demonstrated tremendous success. There's been over $4 billion of investment across those 15 years and across those programs that we've outlined. That's covered multiple engine companies. All of these programs have been done on a competitive basis. We feel we've been great stewards of that investment and the proof is in the data that we're generating on ATP and we'll carry forward into NGAP with our XA102 engine. Yeah, that's great. So Stutz introduced us to a concept called Swap C, size, weight, power, and cooling. And modern combat aircraft depends a lot on computers and electronic systems. And so obviously the engine is just integral to that. And you've touched upon it loosely in some parts of your answers, but really to, to hit the nail on the head, how do we handle those demands today? And what's plan B if we don't? I remember early days of the F-22, and there was a time when pilots had to choose between what systems they ran so that the engine wasn't overloaded with, with swap C. Yeah, no, great question. We see the demands are not incremental in nature, they're exponential. In nature. The TR3 computing processing power is 25 times more powerful than TR2. So it, it's an exponential demand that we're trying to meet. It does need to be looked at in an integrated fashion between propulsion and the aircraft power and thermal management systems. Uh, they need to be done together. The more capability that the engine can provide, the less work you need from the PTMS system and the more you know, massive surgery you would need to bring the system to bear. 
And with an adaptive engine, no matter what you do on the power and thermal management side, you will ultimately end up with maximum capability. I think we really, the point is we need to think not just about the short term, but about the long term and not just the next step, but two and three steps down the road. We talk about the F-35, the vision is that will be operated until 2070. And if we look at the world in 2030, most of the services and the early partners will have completed a lot of their original buys, but the Air Force on current trends will still have about a thousand jets to still procure to meet their program of record of 1,763. I think F-16 history would show that the Air Force is going to need to add capability over time. And I think it's important that whether we, whatever we call it, block five or post block four, it, we really need to think through what are those requirements going to be for that user community in that time frame, And therefore, what are the enablers on the propulsion and power and thermal management side required to get to those long-term requirements? I think that's what we need to do so we don't end up in a situation similar to what you articulated. Yeah, I get it. It's been a long time since GE's fielded a brand new military engine. You've improved the F-110. There's no question about that. And there have been various competitions along the way and development efforts. But when it comes to no kidding, new programs launching, it's been a while. So can you talk to us what it's like to both be a producer of existing mature designs while still keeping that innovation edge? Mitchell is hugely concerned about the industrial base. The Air Force issued some pretty stern warnings last year about why AETP and NGAP are so important and that forward-leaning innovation element and stewarding it for the country. But I know there are a lot of variables. It's a big question, but can you break it down to us? Yeah, so we certainly have a proud history with the F-110, 404, 414 engine lines powering fourth-generation aircraft. And we continue to see new applications, whether that's the T-7A, F-15X or a variety of indigenous applications with selected partners and allies. So we are able to keep some level of that expertise fresh with the engineering team. However, there, there are unique elements with high-end DOD fighters that, that really aren't met in some of those activities. And you've got to get the reps, you've got to do. So we view the industrial base, we view three legs on the industrial base. There's the engineering side and the technology side and programs like AETP and NGAP are critical to maintaining that leg of the industrial base. And we have a generation of engineers that are passionate, that have developed expertise on the, on those programs over the last 15 years. But the next two legs of the stool, the first is supply chain, both the capability and the capacity to deliver advanced capabilities. And if the Ukraine conflict has taught us nothing, it should open up uh, everybody's eyes to the fragility of the industrial base and its ability to surge to meet unpredicted and urgent needs. And the third leg of the stool is sustainment and operations. So while AETP and NGAP have been great to sustain the engineering base, you know, building one to two prototypes every few years will exercise the supply chain capability muscles but will not provide the capacity required to meet those true end user needs. And when we think about a healthy, resilient industrial base that has some capability in both development, production, and sustainment, that's very aligned with how we think about our customers. We run our business with a sense of purpose, trying to support the men and women at the pointy end of the spear and provide them with capability and overmatch. And they need to deter aggression, and if deterrence fails, fight and win. And having a healthy industrial base that can provide that capability. You know, deterrence isn't provided by advanced engines, prototypes running in test cells. It's provided when we transition that into production and give them in the hands of the warfighter. So we think we can really strike both the need to provide an industri resilient industrial base and provide actual deterrence by transitioning these programs into production. I appreciate that. And there's another side of this equation we really haven't talked about, but I think it's very important when we consider the jet engine ecosystem, and that's a commercial side of the business. Obviously, the airline market is very robust right now. There are new engines, both on the A320 series and 737 MAX, that are driving new levels of performance and efficiency. How does that work between the military side and the civil side within a company like GE? Is there a beneficial tech transfer or... And how do you look at that within the ecosystem and balancing the portfolio? So it's a highly synergistic portfolio between our commercial side and our military side. You, know, you go years back in the turbojet world, we would take a J85, we would remove the augmenter, and then you'd have a business jet engine. It was that common. 
Certainly our architectures at the system level have diverged since then, but at the component level, there's tremendous synergies. Whether that's aerodynamic technologies, cooling technologies, durability, what we do in the commercial world at the component level leverages heavily to the military world and back and forth, as well as manufacturing materials technology. In the examples I, I used before, and we have a common turbo machinery supply chain, both for our conventional and our advanced technologies. On the conventional side, that gives us scale. But when we look at things like ceramic matrix composites and additive, they really started in the uh, military S&T world on programs like ADVENT. They did the pioneering exploratory work to provide feasibility. And then with our narrow body leap product and our wide body 9X product, we took that forward on our commercial side and took it through the industrialization hurdles to scale, to get to quality at cost, to go through the regulatory process to certify these, these advanced materials that then we can then immediately turn back and leverage all of that learning right into our XA100 and XA102 engines, and then take that next step forward in terms of capability and complexity, mature it there, take it back over to the commercial side. So there really is a synergy and a pendulum where we continue to take steps across the portfolio based on where the user's needs and where we are in the product development cycle. So we have tremendous synergy throughout our history as well as moving forward. We asked Stutz about this, but I'm curious about your take. If we look across the field of global players, do you see actors like China making meaningful strides towards developing their own next generation military capability? Is Russia still an active player here? What keeps you up at night when you look at the threat environment? Yeah, I think I think publicly there's been reports that China has recently put indigenous engines on the J-20, which is a major step. We reflect back, and I'm sure you and your audience know the significance of April 15th, 1953, the last time a U.S. ground troop was killed by an enemy air attack. So that's 70 years of air dominance, and it's not a birthright. Each generation has earned it. We are proud as a propulsion supplier for the part we've played in that, and we are looking to do the hard work now to earn that for the next generation. So as you pointed out, technology does not stand still or adversaries do not stand still. They are continuing to make massive investments in the, ca the capability overmatch that we've enjoyed for these last 70 years is not guaranteed moving forward, which is why it's so important and critical that we continue to fund the development of these advanced propulsion capabilities and then also fund the transition of those into production so we can get that capability into the hands of the warfighter and maintain that overmatch that we've enjoyed for generations. So if you were to pull out the crystal ball here and look at the next 10 years, how do you see things playing out? Is the U.S. really going to get challenged in the jet engine technology realm? Are there other market dynamics that you think are going to reshape what we see today? You cited some of the major airframe developments that folks are looking at. And obviously, the budget caps on the Hill aren't going to make things easier, but how do you predict the market's going to unfold? Aerospace propulsion is an area where technology and capability are differentiating in terms of competitiveness. So it's not a commodity group. I think Stutz did a great job early on talking about the complexity, the innovation, and the expertise required, whether it's on the commercial or the military side. So it's an area where if you want to stay relevant, you have to invest. We're committed to continuing to invest. We take nothing for granted. On the commercial side, the drive for sustainability across our customer base and the regulatory environment is certainly going to push us to go down significantly different approaches than what we've done over the last 40 years. You'll probably see continued focus on maturing those paths and technologies this decade to be ready next day, decade to make those major shifts. And on the combat perspective, I think continued focus on capability for the exquisite systems, whether that's F-35, whether that's NGAD, the need for more and more capability to address the emerging threat is going to drive in the investments and in what the warfighter is asking from industry. And then there's on the capacity front, things like collaborative combat aircraft and the need to provide a portable mass. So I think those are probably the dynamics that are going to shape the industry over the next decade. Again, we take nothing for granted. We are hungry to compete for opportunities where we can add value and eager to deliver for our customers. No, I really appreciate it. This has been so interesting, and thank you for your time so much. All right, thank you. Hey, and Stutz, always awesome to have you on. Your insights were a great setup here for the framing conversation. Thank you. See you next time. 
And with that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. And if you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to our Space Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas that you think we should explore further. And as always, you can join the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.